Hi. <laughs> I'm standing. X marks the spot. We all have to stand in the same space. <laughs> um, so. The script's coming. The script's coming. So, driving every day, listening to Radio 4 program, Today program, with Brent Spar on the news. This is 1995. Greenpeace are trying to stop it being dumped in the Atlantic. And I suppose I'm asking myself, is there a sculptor's answer? And this is, this is going backwards and forwards in my head. Two years later, finding Peter Fenn's proposals for re-engineering installations for giant algae methane production. So that's 1997, and there's a sculptor's answer, which is, can you make gas from giant algae as he's doing there on the screen. Two years, uh, well, actually about 10 years later, working for Platform in London and discovering the Platform, which is an arts organization, has spun off a renewable energy business, having done a project on the Wandle to, produce, to install a micro hydro system to produce electricity for the music room in a school. And they spun off a business from that which is still delivering renewable energy solutions in London. So starting EcoArts Scotland in 2010, thinking about what connect, how to connect things, doing a blog, running projects, doing a mobile library, beginning to hear about the land art generator, thinking about its relevance to Scotland and why actually the land art generator was something that needed to be here. So, to get ahead of myself, the first of, the, the first of those reasons is about policy. So Scotland has a whole series of very serious policy objectives about renewable energy and decarbonisation. And these are very, very heavy targets that the Scottish Government has set on our behalf and which I suspect everybody in this room is really pleased are there. Um, beyond that, there's environmental capacity. So this is, I've modified this diagram um, because, what I, because I was, it's very difficult to understand what the environmental capacity of the Scottish landscape is to produce renewable energy, but this is a sort of hybrid of what it's actually doing, what's actually happening at the moment, and what a 2005 report said was possible. Thinking about creative involvement, this is Connie Hedegaard, European Commissioner for Climate Action, talking about the land art generator and what, why creative people need to be involved. And it's not the most elegant piece of prose, but it's pretty good to have a European commissioner saying that. And finally, talking about land ownership and the fact that actually in Scotland at the moment, one of the biggest challenges is land ownership because those 423 people, if you look at the distribution of where they own land, are making an awful lot of money from renewable energy that gives them holidays in the Bahamas and new Range Rovers. So, Robert and Elizabeth, who started the Land Art Generator, point out that we used to live with energy production in cities. So, and, and because of that, we used to involve architects in that. And obviously, the Tate Modern is probably the key example of a major piece of energy infrastructure that's converted into an art space. Now, we've pushed the energy production out of the cities because we've worked out how to, to move, to have higher voltage systems that mean electricity can tr be transmitted over longer distances. Um, but actually, that's part of the problem. The grid is part of the problem. Now, it's an issue. It's a political one, but also a creative one. And, and, the, and the NIMBY factor is, an, we know that, that um, he killed an offshore wind proposal off Aberdeenshire because he didn't want people to see it when they were playing golf. So the Land Art Generator has run four open competitions um, in Abu Dhabi and Dubai in the first instance, and then in New York, and then in Copenhagen, and most recently in Santa Monica. And those four open competitions have generated 800 proposals, and you can access all of them on the, web, on the Land Art Generator website. They cut across solar, wind, biomass. Actually, they even include giant algae systems, which is particularly fabulous given where I started. Um, and it's important to understand that open competitions produce collaboration, they produce innovation, and they produce learning. 
and they produce amazing designs where we can see time passing in a different form. Time is energy in this. So what we did in Glasgow was we ran a closed competition um, and we ran it as a closed competition because we particularly wanted to engage the, the community in Scotland and in Glasgow with these issues. We wanted creative practices in this city to get really stuck in with these issues and we were very lucky that actually we were, we were able to use a site, to use a site speculatively, which is right next door to here, Dundas Hill. And as a result, we produced um, three proposals um, for what to do with that site, how to put renewable energy as a placemaking device at the heart of a site before everything else was done, what would renewable energy, do? how could you make renewable energy the thing that defined a site? So the, this is a little bit of the process, which is long and complicated and painful um, and, and very effective in the end. I think it's worth saying this is a complex, sustainability is a complex problem and therefore we need sophisticated interdisciplinary solutions. Um, we obviously produced, oh, that was meant to be the other way around, okay. The result was some press coverage and in a second you'll see that there's an exhibition down at the Lighthouse which I urge you to go and see. I would also say where we have a discussion going on down in Dumfries about another project, um, and I'm trying actually also to get another discussion because there's a huge amount of decommissioning going on in the North Sea now, and I wanna go back to the question of what the fuck do we do with all that infrastructure? What I wanna say before I finish in the last 10 seconds is of course the really big challenge is what would a major wind farm look like if an artist designed it? 